Aloha and good afternoon. Uh, thanks for inviting me. As you probably know, they don't let me out much. Um, welcome to the last session, Who's Looking Out for the Customer? In preparing for this session, I was reminded of the words of the prophet Jagger. You can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you just might find you can get what you need. What do customers want? What do they need? Are those two things the same? And more importantly, are they the same for all customers? Well, the answer to the last question is obviously no. There are homeowners, there are renters, there are growers of coffee, high income, low income, drivers of jalopies, Macy's and Costco, Hattie's of Hilo, your auntie, your uncle, and the brothers, Casimero. Mom and pop stores, farms, and big refineries, smartphones and computers, both yours and mine, Arise. Rock bands and UH, Tripler and the Army, oh, the Navy. People have gone sane and those who are lazy. People who surf, people who Skype, these are just a few of the customer types. So, my staff made me do it. Ultimately, the Public Utilities Commission decides, based on the record before it, what path forward will be best for the various customer interests. But who looks out for those interests? Who brings those interests before the Commission? Business and large entities generally can look out for themselves. Residential and small commercial customers are often a different matter. And the diversity of those customers makes resolving various issues extremely challenging. These issues include, but by no means are limited to the following. First, how do we balance the interests of those that are able to become their own energy suppliers with those that cannot due to financial or other reasons? Second, for those that can or will become energy providers, what privacy issues are involved? And this is interesting. The whole time I've been here, I think I've heard the word privacy mentioned one time, and that was in response to a question. How much information about my usage is really necessary to provide me with the choice I want? And if I don't want choice, should I be required to provide that information anyway? How do customers provide input to the commission on other types of issues, leaving aside smart metering? How do they provide input on the next era merger? How do they provide input on the power supply improvement plans? or the distributed generation improvement plans? And finally, how can we protect low-income customers? As a member of the PUC, and uh, as my new protector, Doug McLeod, said yesterday, I can't answer your questions. But fortunately, we have a panel of folks who can. So first up, uh, we have Jeff Ono. Most of you know Jeff. He's the executive director of the uh, Division of Consumer Advocacy. You would think I would know that. Um, since about 2011. Earlier uh, today, Mark said that no one person can represent all of the interest in the proceedings. But it turns out that by statute, Jeff has to do just that. So here's Jeff. The title of his presentation is The Hawaii Experience, Customer Concerns with Smart Metering, NEM, and the HEI Next Era Merger. Jeff. Thank you, Tom. Um, it's a little unusual to be underneath this slide that says consumer protection, who's looking out for the consumer? When, when the consumer advocate has to ask that question, you know we're all in trouble. But when, you know, when I was preparing these slides, the uh, research analyst that was helping me said, you know, the, the, the title looks awkward. It's, it's, it's what the panel is, is entitled, but do you want to change it, make it a little more exciting, uh, put some pizzazz into it? So I thought about it and I said, well, you know, maybe because of all the stress we're under with the, the number of uh, dockets that we've got to deal with, maybe we can call this, uh, this discussion um, 50 Shades of the Graying of the Consumer Advocate. <laughs> so we decided to just go with the, the title as is. Um, the first. I'm going to be talking about th three se seemingly disjointed, uh, unrelated topics, and, and it's because they are. Um, but the, the, f the first thing I wanted to talk about, and it, maybe it'll lead into what Michael Jung has to say about smart meters, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the KIUC smart meter program. 
And, you know, in 2010, KIUC, Kauai Island Utility Cooperative, um, they were part of a national utility cooperative pilot program for Smart Grid. And they received 50% of the funding for the smart meter rollout from the National Rural Electricity Cooperative Association, NRECA. And uh, so it, it, it was a little different situation than, a, you know, than say, for example, Hawaiian Electric coming before the commission asking for a smart meter rollout. 50% um, of the, the uh, cost being covered by this national organization was a big deal. And the, the actual cost to Kauai Island Utility Cooperative members was about six, $6 million out of the total of 12. Um, so we have some statistics up here. Shows that there were approximately 37,000 total customers on the KIUC of KIUC, KIUC's members. Of those, 2,698 opted out. And, and I just wanted to focus a little bit on the opt-outs. Uh, these were uh, customers who for various reasons, the three um, that I heard most often were the health concerns, uh, that EMF from the smart meters would cause uh, human disease. Um, the second was privacy concerns, that you know, if, you're, if someone was able to hack into the, 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 uh, the system and they would be able to know minute by minute which, which electrical device you're using in your home so they can tell whether you're home or you're on vacation. Um, and these are very real, the privacy concerns are certainly real concerns that need to be addressed, not only by KIUC, but, but all utilities that roll out smart meters. And then the last um, concern was that, and there were there some lawsuits on the mainland where people claim that after the smart meter was uh, installed, then suddenly their bills doubled uh, and, and they could, there was no other explanation other than the smart meter. Um, so, you know, we encourage KIUC to allow people to opt out of the program, and, and so there was an opt-out, but there, there's a cost involved in, in that opt-out, and, and those costs I have up on the board, uh, a, a one and when it says a non-standard meter, instead of calling this the, the old meter a dumb meter and the new meter the smart meter, the decision was made, the new meter would be called, the smart meter would be called a standard meter, Anything else would be a non-standard meter. So a customer who opts out and says, I want a non-standard meter, well, they, they get a, a one-time charge of $50.64. Um, if you're residential, $65 for a commercial customer. And that's to reflect the cost of having to go out and change out a meter. Uh, then there's a monthly non-standard meter charge of $10 for, for all customers. And again, this reflects the uh, uh, inability of the, the utility to read the meter remotely. So they have to send out a meter reader, and that's a cost that the, the utility incurs. That's really all I wanted to say about the smart meter program. Um, one of the things we've been hearing uh, about net energy metering, I've been hearing a lot from the solar industry, and they're saying that if Hawaiian Electric is allowed to change the net energy metering from a credit at full retail rates, to something less than that, that we're going to see this uh, huge drop off on the installations of, of solar PV. So one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to look at KIUC's experience because KIUC ended the, the net, net energy metering at full retail rates a couple years or several years ago. And so we got some statistics from KIUC and, and you can see that up on the board. Over on the left are the NEM installations. And that's total number. So out of the 37,000 customers, you had 124 who were able to take advantage of net energy metering at full retail rates. Back in 2008, KIUC said, hey, we're fully subscribed. We've met the 0.5 of uh, system peak that was required by statute. They, they wanted to move on to a, a different program. So the commission approved ne uh, the NEM pilot program. And that set a standard, a set rate of 20 cents per kilowatt hour for customers who installed rooftop solar. And so you can see how many customers installed under the NAM pilot program at 20 cents a kilowatt hour, a uh, total of 130. That was deemed fully subscribed. They, they hit their three megawatt go goal, and that was deemed fully subscribed. KIUC then moved on to Schedule Q, 
which is an avoided cost calculation. And you can see there's 2,167 customers who have still installed rooftop solar under Schedule Q, which is avoided cost. Now, avoided cost is, it goes up and down depending upon uh, various factors, uh, one principally being the, the price of oil. Uh, the last avoided cost calculation was 11 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, it's a small amount, but uh, it, it, ha it has fluctuated up and down. I'll let you draw your own conclusions about um, whether we're going to see an end to uh, rooftop solar if, if there's a change from a credit at full retail rates to something less than that. The next thing I wanted to talk about, and again, these are all unre unrelated topics, I found it hard to get up here at this, uh, at this panel and talk about cu customer interests and not talk about the Nextera HECO uh, merger. You know, we've heard uh, Alan Oshima this morning, uh, yesterday with uh, Eric Gleason talk about the merger and all the benefits it's brought. And I've been trying to think of a way to kind of categorize these benefits that Nextera says they're going to give us. And uh, I, I, maybe this is going to help you think about the, the, these benefits that Nextera is saying they're going to bring to Hawaii if they're allowed to merge with, with HEI and the HECO companies. Um, but the, the, the first thing I thought you know, we'd look at is benefits that offer the status quo. And these are benefits that Nextera says, we're going to do the same thing that HECO has done. Um, so, for example, they look at the power supply improvement plans that HECO has filed with the commission, and they said, we support that. Uh, they looked at the distributed generation improvement plan, they support that. The uh, IDRPP, the integrated demand response, uh, what is it called? Something program, <laughs> anyway. Um, and they say they support that, but they're not giving us anything better than what, what's been already put on the table. Um, another example of, of maintaining the status quo, Nextera says, they'll maintain the level of corporate charitable giving that, that HECO has, has been so very generous to, to Hawaii and the, uh, local charities. And, and certainly we appreciate that. But they're just giving us exactly what we would be getting if it was still the HECO companies and, and not a merged company with Nextera. Um, the, the other one I want to point out, they, they talk about Maintaining local governance, governance. Nextera says we're going we're to keep a, the local character of the way HECO is, is governed and, and managed. And they're going to do this by having a local advisory board. I don't know what to say about that. It, it depends on who's on the board. Um, if they load it up with HEI uh, executives, then I don't think anyone is going to consider that a true local advisory board. So it depends on who, who gets named to the board, number one. And number two, what authority this advisory board is going to have. And these are all questions that I think we need to ask Nextera as, as the, this docket moves forward. Um, the, other, the other way I want to try to look at the benefits are benefits that are not, have not yet been quantified. So these are what I consider to be quantifiable benefits that Nextera ought to be able to put a dollar sign to. And for example, Nextera says they have access to, uh, better access to capital because they're, they're uh, um, you know, much, much more, uh, they're a much bigger company. They have uh, access to lower cost capital. Um, what, so we should be able to, Nextera should be able to take, for example, the PSIP, the Power Supply Improvement Plan, and say, well, these projects, HECO says they can do for $2 billion, we can do it for $2 billion minus X, whatever that is. And we should be able to calculate those savings. Nextera should be able to give us that amount. What, what, is, what is that worth to Hawaii consumers? Um, another thing that Nextera says is they, because of their size, they can buy, buy things in bulk. I, I've heard Alan Oshima talk about things as simple as, as paper clips and staples. Um, well, that, that might all be true, and, but we should be able to put a dollar sign to that. 
And Nextera should be able to tell us what is their ability to buy in bulk worth to the consumers of Hawaii. The, the third category of, of benefits that I like to look at are the benefits that are subject to contingencies. Now, all these benefits are obviously subject to the contingency of having the merger approved, but there are certain benefits that Nextera is offering that are actually subject to additional contingencies that go beyond just approval of the merger. And the first one is their, uh, their willingness to forego $60 million in the operation maintenance rate base rate adjustment mechanism. So it's the O&M rate base RAM that they're willing to forego for the next four years, and that they say is worth $60 million. And right now, we haven't gone back and calculated the figure. I have every reason to believe the figure is accurate, but that's subject to a contingency. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit of, in, in just a second. The other thing they're offering us is they said they'll, they'll give us a four-year rate case moratorium after the, after the merger. Not that they're not going to increase rates in four years. They're not going to file a rate case for four years. Now, that sounds like it might be good. We don't know. Um, but we have to balance that off. The not coming in for a rate case means that they still get, they could still get rate increases through the decoupling mechanism. And the other thing is that the regulators would be then prevented from looking at something that's really critical to the utility as well as to, to, our, to how much we pay in electricity rates, and that's the cost of capital. If Nextera truly has access to capital that's much better than HECO's, then we ought to see a lower cost of capital. That means their allowable rate of return would go down. But if they don't come in for a rate case for four years, we don't get a chance to, to look at that cost of capital figure for four years. So we have to balance the two, and we have to know what these things are worth. Now about these contingencies. The contingencies are found in footnote 45 to the application. Let's take 15 minutes and read that through. <laughs> and you're laughing because you know you're, that I'm kidding. But it basically says the contingency is that decoupling mechanism, including the both the, the RBA, the revenue balancing account, which is the true decoupling, the revenue decoupling where the, their loss in sales are made up in, for, um, through, this, through the RBA, and the, and the rate-based RAM, the rate adjustment mechanism that gives them cost recovery for capital expenditures. Those two have to remain in place as is in order for us to get the four-year four rate case moratorium and the $60 million that they're willing to forego in o and rate-based RAM. So right now, the decoupling mechanism is under investigation by the Public Utilities Commission. That docket was opened in 2013. We've already had two, uh, two hearings on it. Um, we're waiting for further guidance from the, the Public Utilities Commission. We're expecting an order at any time uh, on this particular docket. Um, we don't know where it's going to come out. So we don't know whether this $60 million and the, the, the four-year rate case moratorium has any value to rate payers. Now, the, the, and one last point. You know, it's appropriate that we're in the Maui Arts and Cultural Center. The, the, the acronym is MAC. That's what people on Maui call it. Um, if you look at these contingencies, some of these could very well be a MAC, but in, in Utility merger parlance, a MAC is referred to as a materially adverse change of conditions. So if something happens to decoupling, Nextera could say, you know, this is a MAC. It's a materially adverse change of conditions. We're out of here. The last category, quantified benefits not subject to any contingency. Now, this could take a number of different forms. Um, for example, uh, in utility mer mergers on the mainland, th th there's a 
Some utilities, Exelon, for example, have, have offered several million dollars that would go back to ratepayers, consumers in a one-time rebate. Um, there have been set-asides for, for low-income customers, X million dollars set aside for, for low-income customers for assistance for them. Uh, these were, are put on the table with no contingencies attached to them. The merger goes through. They're going to come through for that. Another way to, to do uh, 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 these types of benefits that are not subject to any contingency would be in the form of uh, SEAC, Contribution in Aid of Construction. These are monies that would be paid t toward projects that wouldn't be put into rate base, so that rate, rate payers, consumers wouldn't have to pay for it. They'd be contributions from, the, from, the, the, from Nextera. And let, let me give you an example of this. When Larry Ellison bought Lanai, he also bought three utilities along with the island. That was the water, the wastewater, and a transportation utility. The net value of those utilities I don't know, $20 million, something like that. Um, but we were able to negotiate a $10 million contribution in aid of construction from, from Larry Ellison. It wasn't subject to any, any contingency. The merger was approved. He, made to, he, he agreed to make $10 million in infrastructure improvements to the water and wastewater facilities. Those are the types of benefits we would like to see in this merger. Um, and with that, I would actually like to argue my motion that we filed in the Nextera merger docket to, to Tom, but I think he would probably refuse that, that offer. If you heard Mark Tony this morning, you know he's mildly passionate. Um, <laughs> he is the direct, executive director of uh, the Utility Reform Network. He has 35 years of organizing social justice. He's going to talk to you about how to get customers to provide input, a practitioner's approach based on the implementation of smart metering in California. Mark? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about smart meters, uh, partly because I was going to, but uh, to answer the question asked this morning. Um, and uh, we like to talk about the poverty of smart meters. And first, let me start by talking about the strengths of smart grid technology and why we support smart grid technology. We support system-wide improvements in managing electricity distribution, the voltage regulators to reduce voltage running through the lines, the uh, parts of the smart grid that compensate for intermittent wind and solar generation in real time. The demand response programs for industrial and large commercial companies, we think smart meters make a tremendous amount of sense. There's a great value proposition to industrial, commercial, large customers. Many of them have on-site management professionals or they um, sign up for demand response aggregators that can um, help set up automation. Uh, you know, small customers, residential customers, most of us lack energy staffing within our homes or these economies of scale. So, Here's the poverty of smart meters. For utilities, smart meter benefits are immediate, lucrative, and empowering. Immediate labor cost savings. You get to fire all your meter readers. That's immediate. Lucrative return, rate of return on capital investment. I don't know what it is here. In California, it's 10%. Um, that's guaranteed no matter what. No matter what benefits they deliver or don't deliver, the utilities are collecting their 10%. And it empowers the utilities to impose time-based rates, prepaid service, and remote shutoffs. I'll talk a little bit more about a couple of those later. For customers, smart meter benefits always seem to be in the future. They're marginal and threatening. The technology for real-time usage data and smart appliances remain in the future. Um, 
it is very easy to quantify the ratepayer expense, but in California, we have a hard time seeing hardly any benefits for the $5 billion that we have spent on smart meters. And the, really, the remote disconnects, prepaid um, service, and time-based pricing are real threats. Now, I have to be really clear that at turn, we do not subscribe to the theory that electromagnetic frequency emissions or radio frequencies pose a major health threat. We just don't ascribe to that. Our opposition to smart meters has always been an economic one. We do not see the value proposition. Obviously, we see it for the utilities, but not for the customers that pay for it. Um, we do, however, believe there is a major health risk of a different sort associated with smart meters, and that is remote shutoffs, because shutoffs, in fact, create a very big health risk. We saw the slide earlier, the tongue-in-cheek uh, slide from 1910 by the Hawaiian Electric Company saying why electricity is so much better than using a candle, right, to light up your house because it can, the wind will blow it out or your house can burn down. And that does happen when people lose electricity. There have been news reports of, of families perishing in fires caused by candles, perishing in fires caused by electric cords run into a neighbor's house, perishing because of using kerosene heaters and dying of carbon monoxide poisoning, okay? And there's a whole slew of risk short of death that have to do with children getting sick, people who are elderly and disabled needing their medication or having medical devices that need electricity. So remote disconnects is the true health risk of smart meters. Now, redu remote disconnects reduce consumer bargaining leverage, and this is why. You see, when the utility company has to pay to run a truck and crew out to your house to disconnect your utilities and then run it back again to reconnect after you've made a payment, at least at PG&E, that costs approximately $133 for each shutoff and restoration. It gave the utilities an incentive to use disconnects as a last resort in collection activities. Okay, it gave them an incentive to do payment arrangements, to give people more time. But when the cost of a remote disconnect and a remote reconnect is only $16, the calculus changes, okay? Then what, what, what ends up happening is that disconnects become a first resort. Now we tried to tell PG&E, our electric company, that, um, you know, they should really be careful about this, but they didn't listen. And so a year after there was widespread deployment, um, the amount of shutoffs for, you know, disconnections for non-payment rose by 69%. Now we tried to tell the company that the experience of customers, the first experience that customers have of the new functionality of their smart meters to be that they could get shut off is not a smart way to win public support, okay? And in fact, um, that was part of the reason that smart meters were so vociferously opposed in uh, the state. Now, I will say that because in California, um, we've got 98%, 99% deployment. My organization, TURN, is no longer fighting deployment because guess what? We fought it and we lost. And that happens sometimes. And sometimes you've got to move on and look ahead. So what are we looking ahead at? We're looking ahead at time-based pricing. 
The utilities have proposals. Actually, this isn't true. The California Public Utilities Commission has a proposal for default time of use pricing. And that is something which we are vociferously opposing. We do support, what do you call it? We do support voluntary opt-in time of use pricing. Okay, we do support making the product, making time of use attractive enough that people want to sign up for it and are gonna be excited about it and are gonna participate in it rather than people feeling like it's being crammed down our throats. People don't like that. Um, and so I'm going to leave more of the discussion on time of use for the questions because we have other people who also need to speak and we need time for your questions. But I will say this, that there are more effective ways to manage energy load than time of use. The basic problem with time of use, demand response, is that time of use relies on human behavior as the trigger, as the mechanism. We believe that time, that demand response programs that depend on automation, such as air conditioning cycling programs, or appliances that are automated are far more effective in actually managing load than depending on human behavior. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm really delighted to have the next speaker here. John Howitt is from the, he's a senior policy analyst with the National Consumer Law Center, um, whom I had some dealings with many, many years ago. Uh, he focuses on low and moderate income consumers and access to affordable energy and utility services for those folks. Thanks very much. Is this okay? Is the microphone all right? Um, I speak um, not quite as uh, loudly as, uh, as my colleague and, and very good friend, uh, but hopefully you won't snooze after that last one. Um, you know, Mark and I, uh, Mark, Mark talked that, uh, well, we lost on smart meters. But I'll tell you, sometimes the consumer advocates from around the country get together and we win. So, uh, after smart meters were deployed in, uh, in California, well, the utility companies, uh, two of the, the largest ones, put forward a program where uh, if you're a little behind on your bill, they might, they'd want to move you into this prepaid service option where uh, with the smart meter, uh, your usage and expenditure is, uh, is monitored on a, a real-time basis, and as soon as any prepaid credits expire, well, off you go. Service is disconnected, and we work together, and uh, uh, at least for now, I think we pushed that back. Uh, it was a very gratifying uh, experience. Uh, but anyway, um, with, uh, I'm John Howitt with National Consumer Law Center, um, and uh, I really would like to thank the conference uh, organizers and sponsors um, for the opportunity to come out here and participate in this amazing effort that you're engaged in. So uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the introduction as well. Uh, National Consumer Law Center has been around since uh, 1969. Uh, our focus is, in fact, on low-income consumers um, in a broad range of forums. Uh, I work on energy and utility issues, but my colleagues at NCLC are involved with housing, bankruptcy, financial uh, institutions, and uh, a broad range of issues that really are important to low-income consumers. Uh, but before uh, embarking on this uh, endeavor or this spiel today, uh, I, I would like to add a little bit of a, a definitional aspect here. Um, low income is, is a, a term, uh, we, we've all got a different idea as to what that means. Um, and for purposes of this discussion, I guess uh, I would uh, ask that you consider 
households whose income is insufficient at the end of the month to make ends meet. Uh, and that's more of us than I think uh, maybe we'd like to acknowledge. Um, the federal poverty uh, level or the uh, eligibility criteria to participate in a low-income payment assistance program through uh, LIHEAP or the fuel assistance program, uh, that eligibility varies uh, state to state. I believe in Hawaii it's 150 to 200 percent of the federal poverty level. But the fact is, if you have, uh, say you're a single mom with a couple of kids, uh, you need income far over 200 percent of the federal poverty level just to pay for basic necessities. So irrespective of the household type, that's um, when I use that term, low income or lower income, those are, uh, those are the entities that, or, or the, the households and individuals uh, I'm talking about. Uh, let's see, uh, am I doing this? Okay, uh, real quickly, we, we've been talking about uh, the changing utility business model and the regulatory paradigm a lot here over the last couple of days, and it's been fascinating. It really has, has been an informative discussion. But um, particularly for the sake of some of the younger folks here, uh, we just um, put out the reminder that this idea of the existential threat to the utility uh, is, is really nothing new. Back in 1978, we had the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act, um, PERPA. Did I, I, did I get the acronym right? Uh, but anyways, uh, a, a model that required utilities to purchase from non-utility generators. Uh, and when, when this legislation was adopted and implementation began, utilities across the country were, were telling us that's it. You know, the uh, customers will, will leave the grid, will, uh, non-utility generators will undercut our revenues and uh, the captive customers will assume a greater and greater share of uh, the fixed costs, and the whole thing will spiral out of control. Uh, there was other deregulation with retail wheeling and retail access that came after that, uh, and each time we heard about the, the death spiral doing in the utility industry. Uh, and uh, now uh, circumstances have changed, but um, the arguments really are, really sound familiar. And, and I think the lesson there may be that even though we are in a different place now than we were in 1978 and in the early 1990s with retail access in other states, uh, we, we need to be careful about uh, unraveling uh, those important components of the system that, um, uh, that should be retained. And, and uh, when we hear discussion, for example, about um, doing away wholesale with net energy metering or compensation for distributed generators, um, I think we need to be careful with that. And many of my consumer advocate friends do want to do away with net energy metering, but uh, we just urge caution in how we go forward. Um, it has been fascinating over the last couple of days to really hear the perspectives and hear real life examples of the extent to which this industry is changing uh, with technology and economics around distributed energy resources and the communication technologies, uh, metering technologies changing uh, at breakneck speed. Uh, certainly the regulatory paradigm uh, and, and regulatory models do have to, uh, do have to move along um, at pace. Uh, in addition to technology and economics, the uh, policies at the state and federal levels with respect to emissions reductions and decarbonization are, are really bringing about fundamental changes uh, to the industry. And, and they're, they're very exciting. So it seems as though the world is changing at various levels very, very quickly. But as all this is going along, 
some things really are staying the same. And I think for those of us who focus on how we're going to implement a, a renewable generation portfolio and implement more energy efficiency in a hurry uh, and, and move to a regulatory uh, a paradigm that makes more sense in light of today's technologies and economics, we really do need to pause and understand that electric service is still a basic necessity of life. That hasn't changed. And uh, I know a speaker earlier mentioned that with changing technology, well, uh, perhaps electricity isn't as uh, essential a service as it used to be, or the nature of, of that service is changing. But the fact is, even here uh, on this beautiful uh, island and in your beautiful state, uh, electricity is necessary to participate effectively in today's society. Without light and refrigeration, uh, and in some cases cooling services, effective participation really is undermined. Uh, and so as these changes occur technologically at, at such speed, I, I just, I hope that we bear in mind uh, that we have to, uh, we have to consider that not all of us are going to look at changing energy markets and pricing uh, on a daily basis or an hourly basis. Uh, or have access to credit or finances to participate at an optimal level uh, in, this, in this new environment. Uh, not all of us have a 700 or better credit score to get a solar lease to slap a couple of panels up on the roof and, and save a bunch of money that way. Um, so uh, we still need electricity, probably even more so in uh, in the other states in this country uh, than is the case in Hawaii, but still here as well. Uh, we still have access and affordability problems. Not everybody uh, stays connected to the system at all times. Uh, and for those of us not fortunate enough to be able to finance energy efficiency or get access to the capital to install uh, solar power on our roofs, or if we don't own a roof uh, or don't get landlord permission to install energy efficiency measures and we're paying high utility bills, well, you know, it, we still may uh, lose access to essential service from time to time at a rate much higher than those who can participate in the new world that uh, we've been talking about here. And finally, it has been the case for a long time and will certainly continue to be the case that the benefits and costs associated with electricity production and usage are highly regressively distributed. The less you have, the, le the lower your income, the higher proportion of income you have to devote for that basic electricity service. It's, it's just arithmetic, folks, and, and uh, we can't forget about it. Uh, the benefits of uh, electricity generation uh, and uh, the usage of equipment that uh, is enjoyed by higher income households and not by lower income households, uh, I think is important to bear in mind as we go forward. Um, to follow up a little bit on what my friend Mark was talking about earlier, uh, we're talking a lot these days about the existential threats to the utility and the utility model and the business model. Well, uh, I think we need to bear in mind that there are existential threats to some customers as well, particularly those lower volume consumers uh, and uh, lower income consumers that, uh, that sometimes aren't at the table during uh, the discussions such as the ones we've been having here. Um, the rate impacts associated with transmission and distribution system upgrades uh, have to go somewhere. Um, I don't want to talk about the benefits or costs associated with net energy metering and, and believe that those discussions are really territory specific, uh, but absent good analysis of uh, 
of the benefits associated, the system benefits that come from uh, distributed generators providing uh, power to the system at certain times, without good analysis of that and without a showing of net benefits, uh, we are looking at some sort of cost shift here. I, I think that's, uh, that's uh, beyond dispute. Uh, so um, this is another area where uh, some customers uh, are facing uh, a threat. Um, the access to service issues that Mark uh, brought up earlier really are critical. Uh, if we look at a distribution system that less and less is uh, viewed as an entity with an obligation to serve all customers, uh, no matter what, and provide a basic level of affordable, reliable service as we transition, and, and these are not, you know, these are ideas that are being discussed in New York right now um, with that model, uh, then, you know, these very basic access to service issues uh, pose a, a new and increased threat to lower income households that maybe aren't participating in uh, technology the way the rest of us may be able to. Um, Mark mentioned the increase in disconnections in California after uh, advanced metering was rolled out. California is not alone. Uh, and many of the states that have uh, implemented on a, a broad scale are proposing uh, this prepaid service model that uh, we've talked about earlier. So uh, we know that with prepaid, disconnections increase at a rate seven to 10 times higher the rate that apply to those who post pay. Uh, I've got a couple of quick um, recommendations if I can uh, submit uh, in a, I, if I can humbly try to submit, but um, what we are looking at with respect to low and moderate income um, ratepayers really is a, a three-pronged system for ensuring home energy security. Uh, we need affordable payments. There needs to be some kind of bill assistance, and right now in Hawaii that doesn't exist. Energy efficiency is the cornerstone of low and moderate income uh, home energy security, in my view, uh, for obvious reasons that you folks are all familiar with. Uh, the regulatory consumer protection structure around shutoff protections, requirements for uh, payment plans, uh, and other, uh, uh, other types of protections are required in order to ensure as we move forward security for the most vulnerable customers. So very specifically, uh, a couple of things that maybe you can take home. The first thing to do is to get the data. Right now in Hawaii, we don't know who's getting shut off and how frequently. So it would suggest, uh, if I may, to, uh, to the PUC to look at a requirement that the utilities uh, on a monthly basis report disconnections, arrearages, uh, disconnection notices that are sent out and report this on a monthly basis so you have trend data going forward and you know what's going on as you change your system. Um, I would suggest also opening an energy affordability docket where you look at what the possibilities are in terms of bill payment assistance going forward. Uh, none, no such program exists in Hawaii currently other than the federal program, so, uh, so please um, consider opening that. And finally, as you, as you go forward with solar, go big with community solar so our lower income neighbors can get some benefits too. And I went over, so uh, I really apologize about that, but thank you very much. Thanks, John. Last we have Michael Young, the Policy Director of Silver Spring Networks, who are a leading provider of networking equipment and smart grid services in the U.S. and in the world. Uh, Mike uh, has on his card that he is a policy wonk, actually has it on his business card. And he's going to talk to us about consumers versus industry, a false dichotomy. 
Mahalo and thank you to these conference organizers and sponsors for the opportunity. I'd like to ask all of you to close your eyes for one second. Everyone, just close your eyes, indulge me for one second, and listen very carefully. You can open them now. I listened to a fascinating radio podcast about a fellow named Daniel Kish. Daniel, when he was a boy, did the kind of things that most boys do. My boys do this. Uh, your boys, if you have them, probably do them too. He rode his bikes. He played sports. He climbed trees. He was an active kid. Daniel Kish is blind. That's what he does to see his world. He clicks. He does echolocation, like dolphins, like bats, kind of human sonar. Scientists have studied this kid, and studied a lot of people around the world who have basically been blind and stumbled upon using these clicks to interact with their world. And what's fascinating is that if you study their brains, you do MRI scans, the parts of the brain that respond to visual stimuli light up when these folks click. Indeed, people who have lost their sight but have learned how to click describe it as if they could see, not very far, not very clearly, but with some accuracy, especially in the environment immediately around them. Blind people, it turns out, can see. What does this have to do with anything? Well, the question that comes to mind as we talk about this panel is how do we protect consumers? And what was fascinating in this podcast was a discussion about how do we protect blind people? The traditional paradigm in serving the blind has always been to hold their hands, let them keep a hand on your shoulder, to give them walking sticks, and to you know, have little chirping alert sounds when they cross the street, uh, to protect them from their environment, to shelter them. Schools for the blind were always staffed with lots of people to keep them from going too far or going into harm's way, sheltering them. But maybe the best way to protect folks who are blind is to allow them to engage, to allow them to interact, to empower them to see in their own ways. This really struck with me. This stuck with me. I, it, it was provocative. I have a close friend who is losing his sight, and so I'm thinking a lot about this, 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 this these days. And it made me realize that the way we operate our system, the grid, and the consumer protection within that grid system, the regulatory model, is really based on protecting folks, sheltering them. I mean, it is a monopoly utility. We offer these kind of one-size-fits-all products and services. Uh, they're based on models as opposed to data because that's the best we had in an analog, mechanically operated world. And it was really built around an assumption that there would always be a one-way flow, a one-way flow of electrons and a one-way flow of information. But in a modernized grid, in a smart grid, if you will, many of these paradigms can change. Parts of the grid may no longer have to be monopolies. It certainly, there isn't necessarily a need for a one-size-fits-all in terms of products and services, especially as we gain more and more data and access to customers who have different preferences. Not all of us are the same, it turns out. And it turns out the consumer protection with all due respect to those who are professionals in the field, is kind of a misnomer. It is consumer protection for low-income consumers or consumers who are disadvantaged. It focuses on a particular subset of consumers, residential consumers on the low-income end of the spectrum, which is where the help is most needed. But to say it's consumer advocacy or consumer protection for all consumers, I believe, might be going a step too far. I have a friend who's a teacher, and she complains to me that she wishes she could teach all the kids with equal attention, but really she has to focus hardest and spend most of her time on the kids who were really needing that extra pull to, to keep up with the rest of the class. And she isn't able to help all the other kids in the class equally. So my proposition is what if we could do the equivalent of teach consumers echolocation for energy? 
What will we need to do this? Well, first I will suggest that what we really need is to create a wide variety of products and services. Today, basically, you can buy electrons, and that's about it. A wide variety of energy services would include different kinds of pricing structure, different kinds of services you could sell to the grid, you could store from the grid, you could share power from your system to your neighbor's system without having to go around utility. You could do all kinds of different things. You could charge energy storage devices with off-peak power. You could use your electric vehicle both as a vehicle and as a battery. You could do all kinds of different things instead of just buying electrons. A wide variety of products and services. How do we do this? Um, I think Silicon Valley and Route 128 and sort of the technology folks have gotten the ball rolling. I think states can do a lot in terms of incentivizing and encouraging small businesses and startups uh, to, to, to challenge existing paradigms and to break into new, new ways of thinking about how we can reach consumers with products that they've been waiting for, whether or not they know what they've been waiting for. So after fostering innovation, we also need to make sure that the infrastructure is capable of two-way flows. Two-way flows of electrons, and two-way flows of information. Think about that for one second. Two-way flows of information. What if you knew as much about your own energy as your utility did, which is certainly not the case today? Two-way flows of information, in fact, is the beginning in my argument of the idea of giving us echolocation, because now customers can start to look out for their own interests. Customers can now act upon their own preferences. There is some concern about exposing customers, especially low-income customers, many will argue, to the volatility of the markets, of prices that go up and down, especially because they're home all day. What sometimes gets overlooked is the fact that the way we do it right now with a one-size-fits-all structure, those customers who generally have flatter load profiles are subsidizing the peakiest load profiles, because that's where much of that cost is incurred. Let me say that again. In many ways, low-income customers are subsidizing the folks with the pool pumps. It's an uncomfortable reality, but one that is empirically demonstrable. So if we expose ourselves to the markets, what does that mean? Well, it's a two-way street. It's a two-way flow. We are exposing the market to us. And that market, it turns out, is a responsive and dynamic market. I think most economists would agree that the volatility of a market will be reduced if consumers are able to interact with that market efficiently. Supply and demand will reach an equilibrium. Markets will not be as volatile, I believe, as we think that they might be. And certainly, I think, on a policy basis, I believe it remains somewhat unfair to accept the status quo that a one-size-fits-all approach will have the flattest load profiles subsidizing the peakiest load profiles going forward. Fostering innovation, encouraging this two-way flow to reduce volatility, keep the subsidization down, and last but not least, I think we have to facilitate a dynamic market for enabling technologies that will automate much of this interaction for us. What do I mean by this? Well, generally, around the country, the evidence seems to show that when you expose real-time prices or dynamic prices or time-of-use prices, whatever you want to call it, um, to, to market forces so that people can respond to those prices, you see something like a 10 to 15 percent reduction in, 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 in peak demand. 10 to 15 percent, which is kind of impressive. In many cases, it makes the business case work. What's more impressive to me is that when you enable, when you put out enabling technologies, technologies that help people automate their responses, it's a one time set it and forget it. Better yet, it's preset out of the box so that most people don't even need to set it, they can just forget it. It doubles, if not more, the effect of demand response. Enabling technology so that we don't, have to, we don't have to interact with these things day in, day out. The analogy I often like to use is anti-lock brakes. Any one of us can pump the brake pedal really fast and get the same effect, 
but it sure is convenient when an anti-lock brake system in your car does that for you and does it much better than any of us can do manually. So fostering innovation, enabling two-way flows of electrons and information, and putting out enabling technologies that can automate a lot of this action for us. I'd like to, to put a couple of things out there, though, that I think we should all remember as sort of bigger context issues. First, utilities in many ways are natural monopolies. There are huge barriers to entry in this industry. It's a very capital-intensive industry. And utilities, let's not forget, are unique in that they have an obligation to serve. An obligation to serve. Every single customer in a, in a utility service territory must be served by that utility, which is why I believe that markets cannot be trusted to entirely solve these problems. Markets are great. Markets are invaluable tools. But in a world with an obligation to serve, we have to make sure that every single customer has full access to the full variety of technologies and services and products that a smarter grid will enable. And second, I think we need to get away from this one-size-fits-all paradigm completely. I think we should focus our policy deliberations on choice architecture. What should the defaults be? How should the options be presented? Which customers, which kinds of customers should get which defaults and which options will be available in which format to which customers? It makes it more complicated, but it also makes it less than a zero-sum game, which I think we all too often get caught up in. Let me conclude by saying that I think we really have an opportunity to empower customers to see through the dark and to shine a new kind of light on our energy future. Thank you. Would you join me in thanking the panel? <laughs>